anything, but yeah, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started into our study. And uh, we're going into, uh, of course, the book of Zechariah. We're in the sixth vision. We've been going through our studies uh, uh, time and time again. We've gone through Zechariah's first vision, second vision, third vision, all the way and so on. And here we are now in the sixth vision. And so pretty much as we've been going through it, if we go all the way back to Zechariah, you know, chapter one, verse one, we were reading about how just for context and background and everything else, so in the eighth month and the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Bechariah, the son of Edu, the prophet. And so we had uh, gone through our various studies, just talking about the background of this uh, book in general, talking about how that was you know, roughly about 523 uh, you know, B.C. Uh, and of course, the Darius mentioned here is Darius the Great, who was, uh, you know, Darius the First, who was the king of Persia. You know, he ruled from around 522 to about 486. And the book of Zechariah begins with that specific historical context, mentioning the time when uh, the word of the Lord comes to the prophet Zechariah. And so he, play, he plays a part where the Jews are now coming out of their exile from being held captive for 70 years. And so they were taken away of their own doing by diso by being disobedient to Leviticus chapter 26. There's five courses of judgment. They break all five parts. God obeys his part to the contract he made with Israel, and Assyria takes away the northern kingdom, Babylon, uh, Babylon takes away the southern kingdom, and they go away for 70 years. So when you get into Zechariah and into the books of uh, Haggai, and then later on Malachi, they're all coming back into Israel, and they're starting to rebuild. When you see the rebuilding process taking place is the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, and you're seeing them get back into the law, get back into uh, rebuilding temples and walls and everything else, and they're laying down the foundations and everything. And then when they want to know where it is that they came from in the first place, because the 70-year the group or the group that was taken away is not the same group that's coming back. You know, some people have died, some people have been born, and some people have just grown 70 years in their age. Uh, they go back and they have to read First and Second Chronicles to know chronologically where it is that they came from. Now, how is it that they got to this spot in the first place? God gives them their history. They move along according to what they've been given. And so as we had studied before with these post-exilic prophets, uh, my guy you know, focuses them on motivating the people to uh, prioritize the uh, construction of the temple or the reconstruction of the temple and encourage them not to lose sight in their faith and in God's covenant. And then, of course, Zechariah's prophecies, which is what we're doing here through the eight visions and, and so forth, and the foreshadowing of the Israel's Messiah and prophecy to show up, includes all this imagery and, and future restorations of Israel and so forth. And then Malachi is going to address their spiritual decline mm -hmm. and uh, talk about their injustices and religious apathy towards everything that's going on, urging them to continue to press on and continue to go forward. So that's what you get in the first part of it there, but just kind of a review over the first, uh, I guess now it's been five. Now we're going into the sixth vision. The first uh, review of the first five visions was we had the first vision where we had the vision of the horsemen and Zechariah saw different colored horses. He saw speckled white, red uh, horses reporting on the state of the uh, Gentile nations as Israel was coming out of their 70 year Babylonian captivity. And he, they even spoke uh, the, to the angel of the Lord on the state of the nations. And he was saying that actually the state of the nations are very happy that Israel has been taken away. They're at rest. They're at ease. They're comfortable. And so God's more upset now with the Gentile nations that they're not doing anything to help. They're not doing anything. They're actually, that they're that happy that they're gone. God's saying, you know, they've actually gotten me further upset. So then you get into the second vision, the vision of the horns and the carpenters, and it symbolized those worldly powers that scattered Israel in the first place, which as we did in our study, you can see them all on our YouTube channel, first vision, second vision, third vision, fourth vision, fifth vision, and so on. Here we are in our sixth. Uh, we talk about how the horns represent uh, Assyria, Babylon, Mede, and Persia. Those four kingdoms, those four nations, were the nations that took away, scattered Israel by God's command, according to the fifth course of judgment. And so God's now going to send out uh, powers and, and principalities to go scatter them and take care of them. And uh, he'll do it himself even in the ages to come when he comes back. And 
uh, pretty much it's in the form of carpenters. Carpenters are there to tear down. Carpenters are there to rebuild. Carpenters are there to, uh, more so to tear down. They're there to tear down what had scattered Israel in the first place. Carpenters will come along. If you have a pool in your backyard or a shed out there in your backyard, they'll come and tear it down. And then the rebuild, rebuilding will take place. So they're there to tear things down and get things out of the way for Israel. Then you get to the third vision, and you had a vision of a, of a man with a measuring uh, line. He's there to measure Jerusalem, measure you know where it's going to go, the breadth, the length, the depth, the height, that type of thing. And uh, talked about how in God's kingdom, Jerusalem is going to be this very populated, very prosperous, very uh, intense city filled with cattle, filled with people, filled with all sorts of things. And then you get a foreshadowing of uh, even a little bit of the Messiah. Uh, you see just a little bit of that, but they're told to flee from these uh, places that they've previously fled into. God tells them in this third vision, flee from the land of the north, which is in this case, Babylon. Flee from there. And God himself will dwell one day in the land of uh, Jerusalem. You see that in the book of Revelation. That's where he fulfills these prophecies you're reading about in the book of Zechariah. Then you get into the fourth visions, uh, the vision of uh, Joshua, the high priest. So God's now moving. He's getting a lot of stuff out of the way. He's making sure that Israel can go restore, reconstruct, set up. He's clearing the way so that the nations don't attack them. He's making sure he's making sure those promises will continue to be fulfilled even in the ages to come. Measuring everything up so that things are good to go. And then he talks about, uh, you know, well, let's get your high priest going. Let's get Israel's religion going. And of course, Satan shows up and says, well, you can't do that. You know, just like and we talked about how it's almost like a courtroom setting before, again, the angel of the Lord, who then refers to himself as the Lord. And we talked about that, how the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we see here how this is Joshua, the high priest, how he gets uh, restored and redressed into these priestly garments, foreshadowing this, the spiritual restoration of Israel. And of course, Satan comes to accuse him of it and saying, well, you know, this is from the same group of people you threw into Babylon. So now you're going to take them out and restore them? How are you going to do that? They're guilty. And so that that's something most likely he's accusing them of. Uh, you know, it's, that's the devil at his best, always trying to accuse uh, Israel of something, accuse Job, accuse King David, accuse everybody of everything. Um, but, you know, it doesn't work. The Lord restores. Uh, that's the fourth vision. Then we got into the fifth vision last time, which was the vision of the golden lampstand and the olive trees, which, uh, you know, we, we talked about as uh, well. And it talked about the lampstand and the olive trees representing uh, this divine provision for Zerubbabel and for Joshua, those two anointed leaders at that time where Israel's being restored, where those walls are being rebuilt, where everyone is rebuilding the land from the, again, the 70-year the captivity. They're rebuilding everything. They're going to have that uh, God's, it's not going to be by their might. It's not going to be by their power. It's going to be by God's spirit that they're uh, able to do all this. And so we've seen so far five visions of encouragement specifically aimed towards Israel, post-exilic Israel coming back into the land and doing whatever it is uh, that God is telling them in these visions. So now we're getting into the sixth vision now. And as we go into the sixth, seventh, and eighth vision, now the tone of the visions are going to take a little bit of a turn here. And it's not that they're still going to be encouraging for Israel because they are. Uh, they're still going to be aimed at the post-exilic group of Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua the high priest, Haggai, Zechariah, all of post-exilic Israel, the 12 tribes. And it's going to be uh, aimed towards uh, their encouragement and their rebuilding. But God's also going to say, well, we need to address all these other nations that have done wrong. And we also need to make some promises that will take place. Of course, post-exilic Israel doesn't know exactly when that's going to take place. But uh, when we have all of God's truth rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2.15, we can put them all on a timeline and see when it's going to take place. When will God come back and uh, you know, destroy all of his enemies, set up the kingdom, and bring about his, uh, uh, you know, his, his kingdom on earth? We know that from uh, Hebrews through Revelation, we can see that these are when these promises will ultimately be fulfilled. 
we see that in the sixth vision, he's going to address pretty much everyone that's broken his law. And you say, well, this needs to be addressed. Lawbreakers, sinners don't get uh, don't get a free pass. Uh, they need to be they either need to join up with Israel or they need to be dealt with in prophecy. Now, we're not in prophecy today. Of course, we know that we are in Romans through Philemon. We're in the dispensation of grace. We are God's agency, the church, the body of Christ. If we're saved today, we trust Paul's gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. So we're something totally different where we're not in the book of Zechariah. If we read the book of Zechariah and we say, how can I apply this literally into my life? You're asking the wrong questions. Uh, but if we read this and say, how does this apply to Israel's history? Now you're getting the right questions. Now, how does this apply to Israel, uh, the 12 tribes in their history? Now you're seeing this. And how will, will this apply to Israel in their future? Uh, now you're plugging in the right, you know, how can I cross-reference to this in Israel's future? Now you're getting into the right questions now. You're not saying, how can I apply this to my life? Literally, those are the wrong questions. So, so anyway, so we went through all this. Now we're ready to go into uh, Zechariah uh, chapter 5. Uh, Zechariah's six visions. So this vision is going to serve as a warning, emphasizing God's intolerance of sin and uh, dishonesty. It's going to signify that those who engage in unrighteous practices uh, will uh, face swift and severe consequences. Uh, like I said, they're not going to be able to get away with it. So this is not aimed at, say, Joshua the high priest. It's not aimed at Zerubbabel. It's not aimed at somebody specifically in Israel. Now it's talking about all these people who are practically, basically disobedient. And everyone's going to have to face consequences while Israel, while you're on the rise, everyone's going to have to face consequences that are not within or obedient to the prophetic program. So the curse is going to go as far as to enter even their households, consuming them with destruction. So it's going to talk about the importance of righteousness and integrity, urging people to turn away from wickedness and to follow God's commands as uh, to avoid his wrath and to avoid his judgment. So when we get into Zechariah chapter 5, the sixth vision is just four verses. So we'll just read the four verses now and get deeper into them you know, as we go into it now. And so we see here in verse uh, 1, Zechariah 5, 1, it says, Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and, and looked, and behold, a flying roll. And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof uh, 10 cubits. Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with uh, the timber thereof and the stones thereof. <clears throat> so we see just those four verses talking about the sixth vision. And so just like we were saying, when you see Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1, and it says, And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan. You're seeing a specific person in Israel to whom the vision is about or dealing with or talking about. So we're not dealing with anybody particular in Israel uh, now. Now we went through the first five visions of encouragement aimed at Israel. And now we're talking about wrath and judgment which is still a good thing that Israel hears uh, as they rebuild. But it's time to deal with everyone who's not going to be obedient to the Genesis 12, 1 through 3 covenant or the Leviticus 26 covenant, which would be unbelieving Israel, like Pharisees and Sadducees and those that follow the Pharisees and the Sadducees, uh, or even with uh, the nations all around them. Remember when you get into Matthew 25, you read about sheep nations and goat nations, and you're going to have some nations that just will not help the little flock of Israel that will not help that faithful remnant or Israel in general. They'll make a deal with the Antichrist. They're happy, they'll be happy to do that in the ages to come, but they're not going to be happy to help out Israel in any way, shape, or form. So, so we see here in verse one, and it says, uh, uh, Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a, a flying roll. And so uh, this is where we see here. 
that uh, when we talk about a flying roll, first we'll address the roll part. If we look at uh, Ezra chapter six in uh, verse one, we want to see some parts in the word of truth where you know, the, the concept of a roll is talked about. And Ezra chapter 6 uh, brings it up there. Got to get there myself. And let's see, Ezra chapter 6, uh, verse 1. So it talks about the flying roll. And it says, uh, then Darius the king made a decree and uh, search was made in the house of the rolls where the treasures were laid up in Babylon. And there was found at uh, Agmetha, Ak, um, in the place that is in the province of the Medes, there's one of those uh, horns we had talked about, a roll. And therein was uh, a record thus written. In the first year of Cyrus, and, uh, the king, uh, the same Cyrus the king uh, made a decree concerning the house of God at Jerusalem. Uh, let the house be builded, the uh, place where they offered sacrifices, and let the foundations thereof be strongly laid, the height thereof uh, three score cubits, and the breadth thereof three score cubits, with uh, three rows of great stones and uh, a row of new timber, and let the expenses be given out of the king's house. But you're seeing there talking about these rolls, uh, these, these books being mentioned here in uh, verse, I believe it's in verse 1. And I believe it was in verse uh, two as well, uh, talking about these rolls that are there. If you look at Jeremiah 36, uh, Jeremiah chapter 36, verse one, you'll see it again as well. That's Jeremiah 36, verse one. And it says, and it came to pass in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of uh, Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came unto Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take thee uh, a roll of a book. So it's the roll of a book that we're seeing in this vision here. And write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel and against Judah and against all the nations from the day I spoke, uh, that I spake unto thee, uh, from the days of Josiah even unto this day. Uh, it may be that all the house of Judah will hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them, that they may return every man from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. It says, Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote uh, from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken unto him upon the roll of a book. So again, when we see this flying roll, it's the roll of a book a scroll or a roll of a book, that type of thing. This is what the vision's all about. And so uh, remember when uh, he, the Lord forgave Israel uh, in the previous thing, in the previous vision when Joshua the high priest was pretty much, uh, when Satan was trying to accuse Joshua the high priest, saying, well, you know, he, uh, they were disobedient to your Leviticus 26 covenant, and they didn't do this, and they didn't that, and by God's mercy, the sure mercies of David we had talked about in the previous vision, they, you know, God was the source, God was the instrument of, of why he had forgiven everybody, but we're seeing that, you know, because it's because Israel's the apple of his eye, he said, uh, but not some of these other nations that are at rest, we're seeing, that it's going to, they're going to be dealt with in a different manner, and so, we see that there when it says, uh, then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. So it's not just any, it's the roll of book. It's it's a roll, but it's a flying roll. And the reason why you see that there, if you think about, and we had talked about this, we had studied this once before, but if you think about, if you if you go, we're here in Central Florida, if you go to the beach, like we go to the beach here in Central Florida, and sometimes you'll see an airplane flying over the beach and they have one of those uh uh, messages they want people to see, you know, shop at Ron John Surf Shop or eat at Joe's Crab Shack or whatever. And it's and it's, it's flying. Everybody can see what it has to say. And uh, they want you to read the message and understand what it has to say. And it has, and the intention is that it has some sort of ramification for you. Shop here, eat here, do this, do that, understand this message. They want you to know something. And it's flying across the uh, beach attached to an airplane so that a multitude of people can see this and understand what the, whatever the message is. In this case, it's an advertising thing, just in this example that I'm giving out now. But what this is, is 
And verse one, he's saying, then I turned and lifted up my eyes and, and looked and behold a flying roll. So whatever's on this roll, which we're about to take a look at, uh, there's a message that is being broadcasted for everyone to see and for everyone to know. So someone's got to know something and there's a message that needs to be told for, for everybody. And we'll know even in ages to come, angels broadcast gospels, the everlasting gospel. Uh, in some way, shape or form, God makes everybody know you got to either be on uh, with me on this page over here, or you're going to be you're going to be guilty of something. Uh, so even this is in the prophetic program. Uh, so uh, in this case, this is what we're seeing here when it comes to this flying roll. This is why it's there. So we see that there. When we get into verse two, um, we see here it says, "And he said unto me, What seest thou?" And I answered, "I see a flying roll." Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking at. That's what we see so far. He says, um, and the length thereof is 20 cubits, and the uh, breadth thereof is 10 cubits. And so a cubit's about 18 inches. But if you want to compare it to something we see in our modern day and time, uh, just to uh, think about what that could roughly possibly look like, this flying roll, would be the estimated size of a large refrigerator or a minivan or something, you know, an estimated type of height and length and that type of thing. So you've got something really big. You've got something where whatever the message is we're about to see is something that is easily able to be seen. It's it's a big flying roll. It's not a little roll like we saw in uh, Zechariah, I'm sorry, in uh, Jeremiah, where Baruch writes something down, rolls it up, and he can carry it around. It's something the size of a large refrigerator or a, or a um, minivan, uh, minivan type of thing. It's big. So uh, we see that there. And so as we kind of go on to verse three, it says, then said he unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over uh, the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as uh, on this side according to it. And everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. So when we break down verse three, he said, then said he unto me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. This is the curse. So this is what's on the on the uh, flying roll, the scroll of a book. This flying roll, super huge, is that it's it's the curse. And what we're talking about is when you read the law, you've got blessings and cursings on those 613 points of law, which, uh, again, the, the commandments. People think there's only 10 commandments. There's actually, when you read Deuteronomy and Leviticus and Exodus and everything, you get, you get a grand total of 613 points of law, not 10. There are those 10 included in the 613, but the grand total of what you get for Israel under law is 613. And so you see that you know, mentioned here. And so it's the curse of the law when it's broken. So the law brings a curse, you know, when and if it's broken. And so if you look at Deuteronomy 27, verse 16. Deuteronomy 27, verse 16, we see it mentioned here. And so when you go through and you read this, and uh, it actually goes up to verse 15. We can start in Deuteronomy 27, verse 15. But he talks, in some cases, he talks about blessed. Uh, we see in verse, uh, just, just glimpsing at chapter 28, you see, blessed shalt thou be, blessed shalt thou be, blessed is this, and blessed is that, and blessed, 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 blessed. So blessed if you do all these things. But here we are in chapter 27, verse 15, cursed be the man that, maketh any gra graven or molten image, an abomination unto the Lord, the work of uh, the hands of the craftsmen, and putteth it in the secret place, and all the people answer and say amen. It's not that we're zooming in on uh, every single thing per se, but the fact that it says this here in uh, the uh, covenant is you're cursed if you if you start doing this or stop doing this, or you know your, your performance, your works-based performances Gonna, you, you're going to be cursed if you're doing these things or not doing these things according to the 613 points of law. Cursed be the man if you do this. Verse 16, cursed be he that setteth a light by his father or mother. Uh, verse 17, cursed be he that removeth his neighbor's landmark. 
Verse 18, cursed be he that maketh the blind to wander out of the way. Verse 19, cursed be he that perverted the judgment of the stranger, fatherless, and widow. Verse 20, cursed. And verse 21, cursed. And verse 22, cursed. And 23, 24, 25, 26, cursed. I mean, just a list of curses if you're breaking God's law. And of course, like we said, chapter 28, you're blessed. If you do this, bless, 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 bless. That's why Matthew chapter 5 is all about, you know, blessed are the peacemakers and blessed is this because you got some curses. You got blessings and curses. That means Matthew chapter 5 is written to Israel. That means all the book of Matthew is written to Israel. Old Testament Israel. Now that's something that's a shocker and that's another study for another day if you don't know that. But that's uh, another day for another time. You can find that also on our website, on our YouTube channel that we teach about how Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Old Testament and their doctrine. They go to Israel, just like Deuteronomy talks about blessings and cursings. Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 6, and 7 is all about you're blessed if you do this, you're cursed if you don't. So, uh, and just study to show yourself approved on that, 2 Timothy 2.15. But you're seeing all this about the curse of the law being broken. You see that here. And if you look at uh, Leviticus 18, verse 5, you see it again. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 5 says, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. So if you do these things, these statutes, these laws, these judgments, all 613 of them, which nobody does, uh, not only today, but nobody did even when it was given to them, which is why they always had to sacrifice bulls and lambs and goats and rams and so forth. Uh, but if you do them, you're going to live in them. And so he mentions this here. But if you don't, we saw in Deuteronomy, uh, you're cursed if you don't do them. And if you look at Jeremiah 11, verses uh, 3 and 4. Jeremiah chapter 11, uh, verses 3 and 4. Even when you get past Deuteronomy and Leviticus and everything else, and you keep moving up God's timeline, you get to Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and uh, Ezekiel. Jeremiah 11, verse 3 says, And thou shalt say, uh, and then say thou unto them, I'm sorry, say thou unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of this covenant. It's that covenant back there in Deuteronomy and Leviticus and so forth, mm -hmm. which I commanded your fathers in the day that I brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. That's in Exodus. From the iron furnace, saying, Obey my voice and do them according to all which I command you. So shall ye be my people, and I will be your God. And uh, so we see that again, we uh, iterized in uh, Jeremiah chapter 11. But again, when we bring it back to Zechariah chapter 5 and verse 3, he says, Then said he unto me, This is the curse, which now we're understanding what it is curse of the law that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. So we're seeing it's going over the whole earth. This faithful remnant of Israel has nothing to worry about. Uh, aside from, you know, they got to keep their right covenant standing as they continue to rebuild and continue to restore and build the walls of everything there in Israel. And they're, they're not sinless. They still have to obey what they can when it comes to rebuilding the law, uh, rebuilding Israel, rebuilding the walls, rebuilding the temple, rebuilding the cities. They still, they still have to stay. They're still there in the dispensation of law. They still have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as their future. They still have a Messiah coming. They still have to do uh, that which is you know, correct according to what God tells them to do. Uh, so they're not exempt from obedience to the law. But these other people are happy to break it. These other nations and groups are just, they're, they're more than happy to say, I'm not going to obey anything God says. Uh, they're worshiping um, you know, Moab. Uh, they're worshiping all these other false gods. And uh, they're, they're just happy to do it. So unbelieving Israel's uh, going to be not only some of the focus, but the whole world's going to be involved in God's wrath or in God's judgment in the ages to come uh, because of their disobedience to these laws, you know, specifically the Genesis 12, 1 through 3 covenant.
So just like in the first vision, uh, you know, the, the horsemen policed over the whole earth. And so now these charges are being broadcasted over the whole earth is what is going to happen at some point. And, you know, charges of, you know, all lawbreakers are going to be dealt with is going to be announced to the whole earth, whether that's angels in the book of Revelation or in some way, shape or form, it's going to be made known. All, all uh, lawbreakers, all people who disobey what God has said to do are going to pay the price and either get on board or don't get on board. It'll be made known again. Uh, not that it hasn't been made known since uh, the foundation of the world through every through the scriptures or through oral tradition, whatever. But everyone has had opportunity to get on board with God's program, whether we're here in the in the uh, dispensation of grace or whether it's in prophecy. Everyone has that opportunity to understand what God's doing. But in the ages to uh, to come, uh, when God is going to come back in His wrath. Uh, it's it's time to wrap it up. It's time to you know, do everything that needs to be done, wrap it up, and move into the next dispensation, which is the fullness of times. But uh, we're seeing there that uh, God is letting them know that it's uh, they that, that have uh, some laws broken, and it's they've broken God's law in the dispensation of law. That's not a good thing. Of course, he goes on to say in verse 3, For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side, according to it, and everyone that swears shall be cut off as on that side, according to it. So you've got the sins of theft and false oaths often seen on, uh, you know, moral failures in uh, in society. You know, especially it'll happen in the tribulation, and it's it's going to be seen throughout society, you know, leading up to that as well. I mean, it's happening in this society. It's just that we're not in prophecy and we're not in the dispensation of law. So, uh, but these two uh, sins are mentioned. Uh, so we're, we're seeing this mentioned here, but these are the people who are returning from exile for their 70 year captivity. And so it's being told unto them now. Uh, this is the message, you know, specifically for them. Um, so, but when you see there in verse three, it says, uh, for everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on, it says, this side, uh, according to it. And everyone that swears shall be cut off as on that side, according to it. Again, this side and that side means that that flying roll, you know, about the size of a minivan or the size of a huge refrigerator, whatever you want to call it, those one cubic equaling 18 inches type of thing. When you uh, look at the this side and the that side, it means that there's information on this side and that side. There's, it's a two-sided, you know, it's information on two sides of the roll. It's been written on on two sides. So when we see that, you know, mentioned there, the, you know, even when you go back to the you know, Ten Commandments, as you want to call it, or the commandments, the six hundred thirty, they were written on two sides. If you look at Exodus chapter thirty-two, in verse fifteen, you know, this is not something new. Where uh, you've got a, a row and information's written on both sides, or you have God's instructions and information's written on two sides of it. Exodus chapter thirty-two, and that's in verse fifteen. It says, and Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of the testimony were in his hand. Uh, the tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and on the other side were they written. So you've got Moses coming down with the two tables of stone. They're written on both sides. So in Zechariah's vision, uh, sixth vision, where we're in now, he's got a uh, flying roll, and you got information written on both sides. It's it's a normal, common, prophetic thing with Israel that you get you got information going on both sides. So it's a good connection to make. It's a good cross reference to have that uh, information regarding uh, the curse of the law is uh, regarding stealing on one side, and regarding uh, this goes out to those thieves and robbers. Uh, if you look at John chapter ten, for example, you'll see a, a, a famous. Uh, verse here. I believe it's John chapter 10, verse 1. And then the swearings on the other. But John chapter 10, verse 1. It says here, uh, Verily, verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 
So again, mentioning those Pharisees, those Sadducees, trying to enter in not by what God is doing, but by their own man-made way, which a lot of the parables talk about saying, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna work. You know, you're not, you're trying to put an old cloth on new, uh, new uh, garments. Uh, that doesn't work. You're putting uh, old wine and new wine skins. That doesn't work. Uh, you know these guys, these Pharisees and Sadducees, trying to do things their old, their old ways or their man-made ways is, is not going to work when you have a new covenant coming. Israel gets the old covenant. Israel gets the new covenant. Israel again gets the Old Testament. Gets the New Testament. We get neither one. We're not part of any testament or covenant. Uh, again, if that's a shocker to you, that's something we have on our YouTube channel where we talk about that as well. We're part of the revelation of the mystery. We're part of what Christ is doing today, which does not involve nation building. We're part of, 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 if anything, you want to call it body building. We're part of the body of Christ. So we see that there. But in John chapter 10, he is letting them know that when it comes to the curse of the law, you know, stealing, you know, robbing, uh, you, you see a lot of it says the same as a thief and a robber that's going to come in and do things. And you've got these Pharisees and Sadducees, you know, being thieves and robbers of even God's word. And they're doing this through their unbelieving religious system that has nothing to do with what God is doing. Uh, you know, swearing is the other, and that has to do with regards to an oath or even what it has to do with the swearing as means of uh, blasphemy. And if you look at Revelation chapter 13, and we'll see that in uh, verse 6. Revelation 13, verse 6. And of course, it says when it comes to uh, the Antichrist says, and he opened up his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. Um, so we see there, those are the saints, the kingdom saints, uh, Jews, and it goes on to overcome them and so forth. So you're seeing pretty much these two, these two sins mentioned on the flying roll are going to play out when, when the Antichrist makes a deal with unbelieving Israel and the Great Tribulation. You're going to see that these, these two sins mentioned here, whatever it has to do with everyone that stealeth uh, shall be cut off as on one side according to it, and everyone that sweareth you know, through blasphemy or otherwise shall be cut off as on the other side according to it. And so interesting and interesting enough, stealing and swearing is going to deal with those two sins that the Antichrist ministry is going to be mainly focused on in the ages to come. Uh, you know, they'll try to destroy the little flock of Israel. They'll try to destroy the Lord's plans and purposes with what they're doing. Uh, and ultimately, they'll try to destroy the Lord's work. And, and so this curse is, uh, you know, the curse of the law is what comes up. And so you see it in a little bit in Haggai, because remember, Haggai is a post-exilic prophet. You're seeing it here in Zechariah, a post-exilic prophet. The third one is Malachi. If you look at Malachi chapter 3, Another famous verse here, Malachi chapter 3, verse 9. The false preachers use this when they try to get your money. Of course, and it says, Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. And so you're seeing this is what Zechariah is talking about, how you know robbers and thieves are going to be dealt with. And so Malachi shows up a little bit after these two. And so he's not so much a prophet of encouragement. But he's saying, you know, robbers and thieves will be dealt with. And he's saying, you know, Israel, uh, you guys are the ones. And unbelieving Israel says, well, a man robbed God, yet ye have robbed me. And talking to Israel, saying, you know, Israel, you know, you're still under a covenant standing. You need to shape up. You need to, just because the temple's rebuilt and the cities are rebuilt and Israel's back in business, you can't just go back and, and uh, you know, essentially, you know, the term backslide. You can't, you can't go back. You can't keep, you know, failing God and, and cursing uh, and be and remain in disobedience to God's law. Uh, now, the curse is still active. The blessings are still active. It's up to you to decide where it is you want to, you know. But he's saying, you know, you've cursed with a curse. If you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And there's where you get into the ties with the storehouse. Again, talking about Israel, talking about crops, talking about everything that is going on with them. But there's the mentioning of the curse. I think it's in Malachi 4, 5. He says, uh, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and uh, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse, which is what you're seeing there in uh, Zechariah's sixth vision, that 
To those uh, who were disobedient, he will smite the earth with a curse. To all those who were disobedient. And then, of course, you read in, in the book of Revelation, look at plagues and locusts and everything else. While uh, the little flock gets protected from most of that, they're able to stomp on snakes and scorpions from Matthew chapter 28, Mark chapter 16. They are prepared for such things as this. Uh, they just have to, you know, everyone has to decide where it is they're going to place their faith who they're going to place their faith in, where they're going to set themselves up at when this day of the Lord comes in. So we see that we see this here and uh, uh, seeing this uh, kind of reviewing everything here. But as uh, this goes forward, this is where they're at. This is all information given to Zerubbabel and Zechariah and, and Haggai and the post-exilic group. Uh, they they don't know exactly when not God. This timeline, all these faithful promises will come into play, but they know this is something that will come into play. Again, it's encouraging for them, but they're realizing that the whole earth is going to be dealt with. The whole earth will be dealt with, and it's going to be according to stealing. It's going to be according to uh, uh, swearing. You know, again, swearing by blasphemy, God's name, God's word, God's truth, God's temple, everything, which the Antichrist does. And if you team up with the Antichrist, you take his mark. Uh, then you're essentially teaming up with someone who's swearing and lying and cursing and so forth, the devil himself. So, so we see that there. But now we get into verse 4. Still talking about everything here. He says, I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of uh, his house and and shall consume and shall consume it with the timber thereof and uh, with the stones thereof. So as we're seeing there, that there's going to be this curse that is poured out. Uh, we saw it in Malachi. We're seeing it in Revelation. We're seeing you know, there's going to be this broadcasting of a message saying that uh, you know all you have uh, sinned against uh, the Lord. You've broken His laws, and there's going to be wrath. There's going to be judgment. There's going to be a time where you, you're all going to uh, pay for what you've done. Uh, especially those who steal, especially those who swear. And so he says, I will, excuse me, I will bring it forth. I think the Lord will deal with all people, nations who, you know, team up with the Antichrist and do what he does or support what he does or enjoy what he does, uh, who, who seek to indeed, you know, steal, kill, and destroy, which is another verse there in John chapter 10. It's John chapter 10, verse 10. Uh, you know, through stealing and swearing. If, if you look again at the, even the book of Joel talks about this. If you look at the book of Joel, chapter 3, I think it will be in verse 2. Let's see, the book of Joel, chapter 3. You get there as well. Uh, chapter 3, verse 2. And he says here that uh, says, I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among, all, all, among the nations and uh, parted my land. And so he mentions this here. He says, they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. So they're stealing and uh, everything here, uh, you know, selling essentially. They're, they're stealing. It says they've given a boy for an harlot. You know, they're, they're, they're essentially, uh, um, when they, they steal uh, people and, and uh, sell them off. So they're stealing and, and selling people. It's, it's gotten that bad in the tribulation where they uh, have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine. That's how bad it's going to be in the tribulation across the whole earth. This is where you can almost broadcast where everything's going uh, at some point. Um, uh, sold a girl for a wine that they might drink. But you're seeing stealing taking place here in Joel chapter 3. And we get to Joel chapter 3, verse 12. He says, Let the heathen be wakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen round about. Uh, put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, uh, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for their wickedness is great. To the multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So he goes forth and he mentions this here. 
And so he's just talking about how he will deal with these people. He will deal with these nations. If he has to go to the Battle of Armageddon, if he has to bring them into the Valley of Joseph, if he has to bring with them and deal with them and battle with them and destroy them, there will be a, a field of carcasses, as you read in Isaiah 66, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 66, verse uh, 22 and 23. You'll see just a field of bodies. And it specifically talks about that. Isaiah 66, verse 22, just, just carcasses all over the place. Uh, nice. Lovely scene there. Um, and Isaiah 63, where the Lord talks about his garments are just dyed red with blood, about how he deals with all of his enemies in the tribulation. And uh, so we see that there. If you look at Revelation 16 and verse 12. Revelation 16 and verse 12. It says, And the sixth angel... Uh, poured out uh, his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the uh, way the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets, for they uh, are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the uh, earth, and of the whole world, uh, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So again, they're going to go forth and they're going to go to thinking through the uh, lying and deception of the uh, Antichrist and the devil himself that, you know, when this guy shows up, uh, we can go ahead and we can defeat him. We're, we're part of the Antichrist's army. Um, you know, it'll be a different name. He won't call himself the Antichrist. But when this guy shows up, um, you know, we can, we can just go ahead and defeat him. And of course, it's going to actually lead to a, a slaughter. You know, we'll, we'll meet them at the Battle of Armageddon, and you know, we're we're a bunch of great guys with marks on our hands and marks on our forehead. We'll just go destroy him, and that's going to be the opposite because all that stealing and all that swearing and all those lies they have locked in their heads—they're just—they're just—they're brainwashed. They're going to be destroyed. So, but we go back into uh, Zechariah, and we go back to uh, chapter five. Let me get there myself. Lost my place. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 4. He says, uh, And I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall uh, enter into uh, the house of the thief, and into him, uh, into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house, and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. So you're seeing that this curse. Uh, is going to be uh, promised, number one, broadcasted, then promised, then brought into effect, and it's going to sink into the, these uh, guys, no matter where it is that they go, no matter what it is that they do, no matter who it is that they are. It's going to come and it's going to get them, uh, this curse. And so what it is, is the curse through the result of breaking God's law is so dreaded and effective, it's going to chase sinner, it's going to chase the lawbreaker, uh, especially the one that is stealing and or swearing, uh, to into their very house that they go to hide in. And it's going to remain in their house and destroy the very fabric of their house. And um, that's how effective this curse is. And again, when we talk about this curse, it's it's not that it's a physical object. It's not going to be this spiritual uh, bulldozer, if you want to call it that, that comes in and it's just chasing them down the street and you see like this this Holy Ghost bulldozer as the, as the uh, charismatics would say. Or a Holy Ghost, uh, you know, army type of thing, and and we're now we're getting kind of off the rails by saying that. So it's not an object, per se, that will come in, like a Holy Ghost uh, thing that will come and get them. What it is is it's the actual consequence of of breaking God's law that brings about God's wrath uh, and judgment in the ages to come. That that comes about. So when you read that, you go back into verse four, and it says that, uh, and it shall enter into the house of the thief. It's it's the fact that the uh, individual has broken God's law. The consequences of what they have done enter into the house of the thief. The consequences of breaking God's law and allowing, therefore, by default, God's wrath enter into the very house of the individual. Uh, you know, you think about such verses kind of just popping into your head that you cross-reference it in your mind. Joshua said, me and my house will serve the Lord. So all the blessings 
flowed into Joshua's house as far as, if it asked for me and my house, there's a Joshua 24, 15, I think it is. You know, kind of those common bumper sticker verses you think about. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So the fact that Joshua, you know, said, I will serve the Lord and, and do what he says and bring Israel into the promised land and we'll do all that he says, it, it you know, all that he did uh, worked into the very house he lived in. Well, now it's going to be, those are the blessings. That's the blessing side of, of attempting to obey all that you can with the law. Uh, now, the cursing is what you're seeing here when you break the law consequently, the consequences kick in. And it says that the, the curse now enters into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of the house and it shall consume, uh, consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. So if the, the person's, the fact that it's going to attack the very building materials of the house that the person's living in, uh, gets destroyed. And that's kind of encouraging when you think of how uh, Ezra and Nehemiah and Zechariah and Haggai and all of post-exilic Israel are rebuilding all of Israel. That's all they're doing is construction, reconstruction, building, and everything else. Now you're seeing people who are disobedient to God get everything that they have down to their building materials of timber and stones. They're, they themselves will be destroyed as well as their house down to the timber and stones of, gets just completely destroyed because they were disobedient to the curse, uh, to disobedient to the law. The curse comes uh, through God himself coming and will destroy everything, you know, in, in that house. So look at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 33. See an example there. Proverbs uh, 3, verse 33. It says, The curse of the Lord is in the house of the wicked, but he that blesseth the habit, uh, but he that blesseth the habitation of, I'm sorry, but he blesseth the habitation of the just. So see again the difference between the two, what we were just talking about. And that's mentioned there. If you look at Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, verse 9. Uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, let's see, it's the end. There you go, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 9, says um, pretty much there, uh, Woe to him that coveteth an evil covetousness to his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of evil. Thou hast consulted shame to thy house by cutting off many people, and hast sinned against thy soul. For the stone shall cry out of the wall, and the beam out of the timber shall answer it. A woe to him that buildeth a town with blood, and establisheth a city by iniquity. And so again, you're seeing that it's it's all going to come down even to you know, the curse, uh, you know, the sinner and the curse and the repercussions and the consequences are going to come down even to the house and the building materials of that house. It's just that everything's going to be wiped away when it comes to God and his wrath and his what's so-called the second coming. And everything you see in Revelation 19, 11, where he comes on a white horse and he's just uh, covered in the blood of his enemies from uh, Isaiah chapter 63. He'll shake the heavens and the earth. And you see that in Joel chapter 3. He comes with his uh, army of angels, elect angels, in Joel chapter 2, which you see in Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Uh, he's going to just come. He's just going to destroy all of his enemies, set up his kingdom, and uh, allow Israel to remain in there as the head and not the tail. So this gets set up, and if you look at Amos chapter uh, 9, Amos chapter 9, verse 1, what you see in there is another mentioning this as well. Amos chapter 9, in uh, verse 1, and he says, this right, yeah, I saw the Lord standing upon the altar, and he said, Smite the lintel of the door, that the post may shake, and cut them in the head, all of them, and I will slay the last of them with the sword. He that fleeth of them shall not flee away, and he that escapeth of them shall not be delivered. Though they dig into hell, thence shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence I will bring them down. 
and though they hide themselves on the top of Carmel, I will search and take them out thence, and though they be hid from my sight in the bottom of the sea, thence I will command the serpent, and he shall bite them. And though they go into the cap into captivity before their enemies, thence I will will I command the sword, and it shall slay them. And I will set mine eyes upon them for evil and not for good. So again, it doesn't matter where they go, how far they try to hide, how deep they try to run. God will get them in his wrath and in his fury. He'll take care of them. Uh, we see that there. I kind of want to go to that verse I was mentioning a little bit earlier. I believe it was Isaiah 66. I've read this so many times because it, it drives home a good point. Isaiah 66, verse 22. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 22, and it says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon unto another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Talking about he sets up his kingdom, and now nations come to worship him. It says, And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So there's just carcasses everywhere. Before you get to the kingdom, before you see that, as Zechariah talks about, that city filled with prosperity and population and cattle and rejoicing and singing and, and happiness, there's, there's carcasses everywhere where the Lord came and took care of business. And if you want to see where the Lord takes care of business, go just three chapters back to Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 1. We'll read that now. Isaiah 63 verse 1, it says, Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? Uh, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in this greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? So they're asking, who is this that's dyed completely red in his apparel? And it says, uh, it's the Lord Jesus Christ who comes in that so-called second advent. That's his second coming. He's covered in red. He's, he's covered in blood. Blood of his enemies just slaughtered them. Those carcasses you read about in Isaiah 66. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people... There was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And so on and so forth. You get that there. So as we plug all this in, we go right back to Zechariah chapter 5. We see it in verse 4, and he says, I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief, and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the midst of the house, and it shall consume it with the timber thereof and with the stones thereof. You're plugging all this in together, you're cross-referring all these verses, and you're seeing that this is what the sixth vision of Zechariah is talking about here. And it's, it's, it's promising if you are post-exilic Israel. It's a great thing to read about how God's enemies will be dealt with. It's a wonderful thing to see. You know, the verse reinforces the message of the previous one, emphasizing that the curse uh, you know, brought about by, you say, the flying scroll has serious consequences for those who commit theft and falsehood. God's judgment will be executed upon the wrongdoers, leading to the destruction of their households as a result of their sinful actions. But as far as when, uh, you know, when it comes to post-exilic Israel, they they get the promises, they collect the dots, they just aren't able to connect the dots yet. There still is, in, in their future, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're not there yet. They're not, in this point in the book of Zechariah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John hasn't taken place yet. That's still, old. those are still Old Testament books that will, will take place. Uh, but Zerubbabel and post-exilic Israel knew the promises of God were true and solid. They just didn't know when exactly they were going to take place. And they had other books as well that they could you know, read about, study about, and know that these things were going to happen. They had Joel. They had Haggai. They knew that God was going to shake the earth at some point, uh, shake the heavens, shake the earth, bring about his uh, army of angels to uh, destroy. Um, but they knew the curse of the house of the thief when God declared by the Lord of hosts would, you know, is going to bring it forth. Uh, so it suggests, the imagery suggests that God's judgment is active, it's inevitable, it's going to take place, it is going to happen. 
and it will reach those who commit acts of theft and acts of deceit. You know, the curse's entry into their very houses symbolizes the fact that they cannot escape God's judgment. So we see that there. And then if we look at uh, Amos chapter 5, verse 19. Amos chapter 5 in uh, verse 19. This is always a great uh, verse to read here. So if you've got someone who has more or less, verse uh, 19, yeah. And we'll actually, we'll actually go to uh, Amos 5.18. So if you have somebody who is um, more or less stealing or swearing, teaming up with the Antichrist, disobedient to God, his laws, his plans, his purposes, and not joining up with the little flock of Israel, having nothing to do with God in the ages to come, this is what it's going to be like for the thief and one who swears falsely by God's name in the, in the ages to come, in the day of the Lord. Amos chapter 5, verse 18 says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light, as if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or went into the house and leaned his hand upon the wall and a serpent bit him. So it's, it's one of these things, no matter where the uh, lawbreaker, sinner, uh, goes in the ages to come, in Daniel's 70th week, in the day of the Lord, no matter where he goes and where he tries to escape from, where he tries to flee from, the uh, again, in this case, uh, the thief or the one that swears falsely by God's name, no matter where he goes, even if he runs into his house and locks the doors and hides under his bed and whatever, uh, it says that it's going to be as if a man did flee from a lion, but a bear meets him. Or if he goes into the house and leans his hand on the wall, but a serpent bites him. So there's just no escape from what's going to happen if they remain disobedient. And so when post-exilic Israel gets this as the sixth vision, they're you know in reconstruction mode. They're building up and rebuilding and understanding that things are looking pretty good for them. Things are looking really good for them because they're understanding it's not by their might, it's not by their power, it's by God's spirit that their leaders are going to be um, uh, charged up with the Holy Ghost, so to speak. It's, again, another, sounds like it's Pentecostalism there. But, again, that's what you're seeing here in the in the fifth vision. Here we are in the sixth. But uh, we kind of saw that with King David in the, in the book of, in the book of uh, Kings, it was. But... Uh, You'll see that in the fifth vision, where the leaders are, are all, all uh, let's say, um, associated with the Holy Ghost. You see that the reconstruction is taking place. The kingdoms are being dealt with, those, those Gentile kingdoms. Uh, the, the measuring line is out there. Everything is moving along. And now they're saying that all of the world is going to be dealt with. All of the world who has broken uh, God's law, God's covenant, is going to be dealt with. And so we see this here in Zechariah's sixth vision. So uh, with that, we'll uh, stop a little bit early and see if there's any kind of thoughts or comments on this sixth vision, uh, because then there's going to be two more visions. We're going to get to the seventh vision, which is going to lead more into dealing specifically with Babylon and wickedness and everything else, because uh, Babylon is still a nation, even though they've come out of the nation, even though the nation is, uh, you know, they're no longer in it. And they're being told in another vision to flee out, flee from the land of the north and just keep coming out of it. Uh, it's back on the scene in the book of Revelation. You know, they they are still some, the Antichrist is going to pump it up again and make sure that the wickedness goes through that nation and that it's it, it becomes back on the scene again. And they, so, so God's going to give something in the seventh vision. And then we're going to see more in the eighth vision, but it's all going to be dealing with wrath and it's all going to be dealing with things concerning God's vengeance, God's wrath, and it's dealing with the other people, other nations. So, so that will stop here, see if there's any kind of thoughts or comments on Zechariah's sixth vision there in Zechariah chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. Well, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I'm so glad I live in this dispensation. <clears throat> That's scary when you can't, you can run, but you can't hide. Yeah. yeah. You know? I have I have a few questions actually because I'm confused a little bit. My confusion comes, I guess, 
understanding what's going on here in history. The 70 years that Israel has been in captivity is ending. They are going to reestablish Jerusalem by measuring and getting cattle and all these other things. Those, those people are those that put Israel in captivity. They were not Jews because all the Jewish tribes were in captivity as well. So the, we're talking about Gentiles here. Yeah. Gentiles, Gentiles were supposed to know. Gentiles didn't have a covenant with God. Israel had the covenant with God. Yeah. So how would how would the Gentiles understand what the law is and all the points of the law if the law didn't apply to them? Uh, well, they're supposed to come to Israel. Pretty much Genesis yeah, in twelve. The future, no, in the no, future. no. But the law, it's, it's the dispensation of law. So they're supposed to go to Israel. The, the kingdom is always supposed to be a thing where where Israel's the head and uh, not the tail, uh, where Israel is the uh, the nation where God is working through. And right. is, the fact that Israel is disobedient, that's their fault. But so, that's, this is a, you're talking future of the kingdom. You're not talking, there's not a kingdom now. I mean, and there like, wasn't a kingdom at, at this time when, after the seven years has ended. But they were rebuilding it. Right, they were rebuilding it. But God's taking his wrath out on these on these and and I don't know. I'm trying to understand what what you what you said. Yeah. So God promises that He is going to deal with all those who will continue to remain disobedient to God's plans and purposes, and that are not following the law. Right. What well, which is remaining disobedient to God's plans and purposes and prophecy. Okay. I'm just I'm just because Pharisees and Sadducees are disobedient to the law. Right. I, no, I get that. I do get that. But Pharisees and Sadducees are Jews. You would, you know, if anybody's going to be disobedient, it would be a Jew because they have the law. It wouldn't be a Gentile because they don't understand what the law is. But they can come to Israel and understand it. So I guess is your question: What draws the Gentiles you have, to the Jews? You, when you study, when you study uh, Solomon in his day, you know. Queen Sheba comes and learns right. what's supposed to be going on. There's people that are supposed to be learning what's going on. And it's not that God takes it and, and hides it so they can never understand it. Uh, it's always available to everyone, they, but they have to come and willingly. Do they have to proselytize into the faith to understand? Or, or support it, yeah. Because remember, even, even with uh, Ruth, Ruth was, uh, was uh, in the land of Moab. And uh, she was a Moabitess. She had, you know, nothing to show. Her husband, her first husband dies. She has nothing. And then, uh, was it, I forget who that was, but her, her mother-in-law said, well, I, I'm a Jew. I'm going back to my land. I, at least I got something over there. And she clings to her mother and says, well, wherever you go, I'm going. I, I don't care. I just want to support you. And then the Genesis 12 covenant kicks in. And the more she's obedient to, per se, she says, I want to obey. I want to go with you and obey your God. You know, I'm just going to do what you do, and and whoever your God is, I'm just going to obey it. Well, that activates the tw Genesis 12 covenant, and she starts getting blessed. The more she does, you know, favor towards, she doesn't even know she's doing it. She just she just starts blessing as much as she knows how to do, and then Boaz comes into or like Ruth and Boaz and so forth, and now this Moabitess who had pretty much nothing is now plugged into the prophetic program, and and. And is uh, a part of everything that's going on. And she didn't get a broadcast. She didn't get a sign. She didn't get a, 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 a Jewish, um, what's it called? Uh, yeah, vision. Or, or she, and she didn't get a, uh, what's it called? A, a person who flies over there and, and teaches them. What are they called? They, they have them today. Uh, I was thinking of evangelizing. Because... Well, yeah, yeah. That's when, once ago, when you go over there and you teach somebody something, you come. Missionary. Like, yeah, there, there was no missionary that went to Ruth and said, here's what you need to know about God and his prophetic program. So she she went. And when, the more she went, the more she was obedient. And, and then the, the promises and the blessings started <laughs> kicking in. And it worked for her, as it would work for anyone who was faithful to what God had, inst uh, had instituted at that time in the dispensation of law, which is the Genesis 12 covenant. And see, there were more signs and wonders during this time 
for others to see as well. Yeah, but, but you're, but you're, no, I, I agree with that. I guess my confusion comes in the corner because this is about the whole world now. This is about a small group of people, right? When, when, when God's going to take His wrath out, yeah. on, He's yeah. going to take it out on everybody. Yeah, and He's going to take on everybody because they're not following His law. Yeah, yeah, and so He'll send, like you read in the Book of Revelation. You've got, you've got Revelation fourteen six, where an angel comes in and preaches the gospel, the everlasting gospel, right? And He tells them, "Don't you know, worship God, not, not this guy." You know, worship the God who created the seas and the, and the mountains and the earth and everything else. I'm paraphrasing that, but, uh, you know, worship God. And and there's other times where people, and plus people could pick up the scriptures. I don't know if they would call it a Bible, but at any time people could read the scriptures. And again, that goes towards the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all that. And if they disregard it, rewrite it and rebroadcast it, restate it and reword it. And that's their fault, Pharisees and Sadducees, because you've got, you've got, a faithful remnant in Israel, as we talk about prophecy, you've got unbelieving Israel, as we talk, about, and then you've got the whole world of Gentile nations who've, uh, you know, got to kind of catch up to what God's doing. They've got they've got to learn it for themselves. They've got to understand it for themselves. So, do you think the little flock, in a sense, evangelized? Or is it just well, they, what other people saw? The little flock will, but when they go, when when the whole Gentile nations are are worshiping false gods, it shouldn't make sense to them. They should say, well, you know, the worshiping of Dagon, the fish god, this shouldn't make sense because some other person, some other creator made the mountains and the oceans and the seas and the sun and the moon and the stars. And when when they, whatever religion gets created for Dagon, the fish god, and uh, for Baal that you read about in the, and all this Baal worship, and they put together the, the the absolute doctrines of whatever it is they're being taught in the Old Testament. They should say, well, something doesn't add up because when you put together two plus two, it's always coming five or six instead of four. So something's not right, but we'll just keep doing it and we don't know why. Or we're going to go seek out and find out what we can find out and uh, you know, we'll, we'll find, the truth. find the truth. Yeah. There's many instances that you see, even in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where they want to just grab the skirt of the Jews. Yeah, yeah, you get centurions yeah. in the book of Acts that, that uh, <laughs> you know, when they see well, the Lord show up, they, they say, you know, I, I know, you know, Lord, clearly you're the Lord. Yeah. Well, I guess the problem I see is that with the exception of those people today that rather divide the word of truth and they know, they know they're members of the church, the body of Christ. I mean, that's a very small group of people. Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of people in religion today that believe they are spiritual Israel. Yep. And as a result of that spiritual Israel concept, they're not following the law either. No, no, they're not. But it's up to us to go out there and tell them, hey, you know, here's, let's have a conversation. You know, and and we're here to we're here to broadcast almost like that flying roll. We're there to broad. We're here to be. If you want to take a spiritual example or a spiritual lesson from the book of Zechariah, we're to be the flying roll that just broadcasts the information. They can hate it, they can like it, they can lump it, they can leave it, they can believe it. But we're just there to broadcast the information. We're not there to uh, grab their necks and say you better believe this. And and uh, although they better believe it, but it's not. We're not. We're not there to grab their neck. We're not there to force them. We're not there to, to mentally wrestle with them we just say here's the information and if they say well i don't believe it and say well i did my part by giving it mm -hmm. i'm not here to hold you to the ground i'm not here to have mental gymnastics with you i'm not here to have semantics with you i'm not here to play games with you i'm not here to win you in this mind wrestling game or whatever i'm just broadcasting you the information once i give it to you you're on your own and you can you can hate it you can mm -hmm. disagree with it but I did my job in giving it. You know. uh, you had also said that uh, when when uh, let me see where I I can find the word here. But I had a question about it as well. Uh, into the uh, the flying robe, but. Uh, 
the curse that goeth over all the face of the earth. And it goes into the house. This this is not. Is this a spiritual plague? As because you said the house. Yeah, I was trying to I was trying to explain that because yeah, it sounds like it's a uh it sounds like it's a yeah, I was it's, no and I was trying to say it's a result of the consequences of disobeying the law. So when that when that individual, that that lawbreaker, the sinner, that the 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 person who's loyal to the Antichrist, if we're talking way in the future, if we're talking yeah. about someone who's uh well when God comes on his white horse and he's destroying all of his enemies. Uh, that person is going to realize, well, it looks like I did the wrong thing. Looks like, and so he's going to flee into his house. He's going to flee into the mountains, as Isaiah two talks about. People flee into mountains. People flee into houses. People flee into wherever they go. And of course, Amos talks about no matter where you go, you can't you can't avoid them. And so, uh, no matter where they go, uh, they're going to have, as a result of being disobedient to the law, uh, as a result of those consequences, the curse comes the curse it and the curse is god god comes and destroys you okay so it's not a, it's not a spiritual thing it, it's an actual destruction of yeah. people yeah. okay because uh, or or if you joined up with a little flock you know god is telling you flee into the wilderness get away from all the places where i'm going to send earthquakes and famines and plagues and locusts and everything you get over here you'll be fine <laughs> wherever that is you know in the wilderness somewhere uh, or, or wherever, and you'll, I'll give you manna, I'll give you food, I'll give you protection, I'll give you water, I'll give you whatever, and you'll you'll be good for three and a half years, or whatever. Uh, so you you won't have to worry about certain things because you'll be protected, uh, you'll be blessed during the time of serious cursing, uh, and then you'll go into the kingdom. Otherwise, I'm coming, I'm going to destroy, and at the same time, I'm coming in my wrath. There's going to be plagues, locusts, earthquakes, uh, famines, and wars, and and anti-crime and everything. It's going to be a mess. And you'll suffer one way or another. Okay. 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 Let's let's get back. I just want to make sure I understand. There's two individual. I'm trying to I'm trying to determine the timeline here because it, it sounds to me like there's two individual or two separate events. We've got an event that's going to happen to those who um for lack of a better term for bed. Israel after they got out of the captivity. God's going to deal with them. Uh, they, oh, 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 the um, Gentiles. Yeah, it's probably like Zerubbabel Bowl and um, uh, Joshua the high priest. And, and... Yeah, but those those are Jews. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are Jews. But he's going to deal, at least what we're, what we're finding out is these curses that are coming their way. It's going to be coming to them as well, right? These These People who God's disgusted with, as far as after the after the uh, Jews are released from Babylon, and yeah, but they don't know when. Okay, they they, they know it's coming. They just don't. They don't know if it's next week. They don't know if just like when we read. In, okay, okay, okay. That's, just like okay, in, that makes a difference. Okay, just like when you read in, uh, I think it's in uh, in the second or third vision, and he talks about how. Um, Jerusalem is going to be a nation, uh, a city that's going to be filled. Oh, it says uh, uh, Jerusalem is going to be a place that's just filled with filled with people, and it talks about how. Uh, I think it says, "My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad, and uh, and the Lord shall yet comfort Zion, and yet shall choose Jerusalem." Uh, so it's going to be, uh, Jerusalem will be in uh, at some point a huge, prosperous, enormous, great, wonderful, huge city filled with cattle, filled with people. Right. They don't know when that is. That could be as a result of five years after they build Jerusalem, or this could be a promise, a kingdom promise. They they know it's going to it's going to get more. Oh, okay. They I know it's going to be more and more okay. populated. Okay. I get it. Okay. So this they, is a continue continuation this yeah. is yeah this this is something that isn't necessarily going to occur uh today no not today at the time of the release of the jews from babylon and yeah their captivity it, it just appeared to me that what we're talking about here what we were talking about is mm -hmm. the anger god's going to pour out is going to be on those people that pretty much were grateful that that uh 
that uh, Israel was captured and everything was fine in well, Germany. Yeah, well, it's going to it's going to pass from generation to generation. Of okay. course, so it wasn't it wasn't dealt with at that time. Yeah, yeah, well, we know that now because of where we're sitting in history and the dispensation okay. Okay. okay, I just want to clarify. Yeah. Okay, that's but these these promises will carry into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Agree. And and the Lord will quote this in Scripture to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay, I get it. Yeah, okay. this that has not occurred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's why this is such a deep book. Because yeah, it is. It, it is. is. It can be hard parts of it. even something four verses can be. Yeah, four. Yeah, yeah. But it lines things up on God's timeline. Yeah, and puts things in yeah. perspective. Yeah. So you can't look at you can't look at story. Or the captivity, for example, and God's anger with those that turned their back on Israel and were grateful they were captured, and and think that He dealt with it then, and he, right? And it's and it's done, right? Right. Or there's going to be two separate events. He dealt with it then, but He's going to deal with it right here as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. All right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Any other any other thoughts or comments while we're on Zechariah's sixth vision. Yeah, then we'll get to the seventh vision. There's there's way more in there that's it's pretty deep. And then you get the eighth vision. And again, more more to go into, more to dive into, more to deal with. So so yeah, we'll uh, we'll stop there. I mean, it was just four verses, but there's a lot in and one vision of four verses. So so yeah, we'll stop here and then we'll uh, we'll be back here on Wednesday with uh, the seventh vision of Zechariah. So we'll see everyone later. We'll see everyone on, one, excuse me, on Wednesday. Bye.